Hi, I'm Dr. Randy Robinson, and in part one of maxillary mandibular advancement for obstructive sleep apnea, I'll explain the surgery and why it's indicated to treat this prevalent disease. In part two, I'll have a patient example as well as the patient's own testimony. Obstructive sleep apnea affects 20 million people in the United States. It is costly in terms of dollars as well as lives. 30% of the population has a facial deformity that can be contributing to their obstruction. This is seen in the literature in that orthognathic surgery or jaw surgery can be 95% successful in curing obstructive sleep apnea. In fact, there are nine facial predictors to determine if the skeletal structures are a part of the obstruction. Mainly, it is due to the posteriorly positioned maxilla and mandible as outlined in this article by Lowe in 1986. Angle number one shows the base of the skull with the mid face or maxilla and the mandible. In this case, both are retrusive, not just the lower jaw. So by advancing the face, it can open the airway. This is because the posterior airway or PSA at the back of the tongue should normally be 12 millimeters. In the case of deficiencies, this airway is narrowed and less than 12 millimeters, contributing to the obstruction. You can see in this x-ray how the airway is actually the size of a straw. When the patient lays down, the tongue drops back and easily occludes the airway. By advancing the mid-face and the lower jaw, the airway can be greatly increased. In this case, the airway was more than tripled in size, relieving the patient of her obstructive sleep apnea. The reason this works is due to the physiologic equation called Posuli's Law, where the radius is inversely proportional to the fourth power related to the pressure flows, which relate directly to the volume throws, uh, flows. So in maxillary mandibular surgery, in planning based on the computer and the clinical measurements, the facial soft tissues can be advanced to accommodate the bony position, keeping within an aesthetic range. Once the position is determined, then plaster models, or in some cases, virtual digital radiology, is used to design a splint which positions the teeth during the operation. The operation take, typically takes about three hours to perform under a general anesthetic in an outpatient setting. All the incisions are inside the mouth and the teeth are not wired together. The bones are fixated using titanium plates. The bilateral sagittal split or lower jaw surgery shows the advancement sliding the bone on itself so there is good bone to bone union. In the mid face, the maxillary Lafort 1 osteotomy, the cuts are inside the mouth, below the eyes and above the teeth. This allows for advancement of the upper jaw which is then held into position also with titanium bone plates. Usually there are four plates on the bottom and four plates on the top, but there's some variations on that arrangement. The patient, again, is not wired together, and uh, they are held into position using rubber bands while the plates hold the bone rigidly during the healing phase. The elastics are changed by the patient, usually a couple of times a day, so the patient can maintain a non-chew diet. Most patients will lose, lose about 10 to 15 pounds during the operation. Additionally, the chin can be advanced also to pull the muscles of the tongue forward. The nasal surgery and surgery in the back of the throat can be performed at the same time through the Lafort operation or through the jaw surgery operation. So who's a good candidate for this operation? anyone who can't tolerate CPAP or is tired of wearing the mask. Some patients are, have very effective treatment with CPAP, but they can't keep the mask on overnight. Oral devices can also be helpful, but some patients experience jaw pain or tooth pain or changes in their bite. Again, compliance can be an issue, particularly with some devices that try and hold the tongue forward. The locations of the obstructions can be in the nose, the back of the throat, and the palate called the oropharynx, or just below the tongue called the hypopharynx. These areas can be addressed with different types of operations. Typically, the Stanford protocol uses a phase one and a phase two. Phase one treats the nose, the back of the throat, and then the tongue position through 
typical operations, either through a septoplasty in the nose or a U triple P in the back of the throat or a chin button advancement to help with the hypopharynx. However, none of these address fully all areas at once. And the main problem of the tongue position is not truly addressed, particularly when the lower jaw and the mid face are small. That's why phase two or maxillomandibular advancement addresses all three. Again, in another patient, you can see the narrowness of the airway because the overall face is deficient. So by advancing the entire face, the airway can be opened. This concludes part one and part two will give further explanation and also a patient example. Thank you for your attention.